Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome again to Financing Climate Action Conference 2020, which is part of IGEM 2020. Um, the Malaysia Green Building Council this afternoon hosts you to a very exciting panel session. Um, this panel session will be called Policies and Practices to Enhance Green Finance or otherwise I've heard uh, transiting into the finance. Uh, anyway, without um, much ado, let me introduce you to your moderators who will then introduce you to the exciting panel of speakers we have lined up for you this afternoon. Um, but first, let me please uh, inter uh, bear with me while I introduce you to this prolific person, our moderator, Datin Sri Sunita Rajakumar. Datin Sri is a professional independent director and a strong advocate of the importance of governance general, in general and risk management in particular. She founded Climate Governance Malaysia, the country chapter of the World Economic Forum's Climate Governance Initiative, and is a fellow of the Institute of Corporate Directors Malaysia. She promotes gender diversity on boards with the 30% Club, a member of the Global Advisory Board of Nottingham University's School of Business, and sits on the advisory panel of the United Nations Global Compact, Malaysia's Sustainability Center of Excellence. She is chair of Caring Pharmacy and independent director of Bursa listed Dutch Lady Milk Industries, MCIS Insurance, Zurich General Insurance, and trustee on five charity foundations. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our moderator for this afternoon, Datin Sri Sunita Rajikumar. Thank you. Thank you so much, BK, for having me. It's indeed such a great pleasure to be here. And I know we all want to thank IGEM for this Financing Climate Action Conference that is co-organized by the Green Building Council, MGTC, and the British High Commission. It gives me great pleasure to introduce you to our fantastic lineup of panelists. Uh, we will be hearing from Promote Das, the group CEO, Deputy Group CEO of RAM and CEO of RAM Sustainability, which is a wholly owned subsidiary. Promote has been 25 years in the financial services industry, including the past 20 years at RAM. Since 2016, he has been spearheading RAM Group's involvement in the United Nations supported Principle for Responsible Investment Statement and is also a member of PRI's Advisory Committee on Credit Ratings. RAM Sustainability is the first ASEAN-based provider of sustainability ratings and second opinions. It just became an approved verifier for the certification of climate bonds by the Climate Bond Standard Board. And uh, following that will be Luan Xia. She is the Senior Managing Director, Head, group, head of Group Sustainability of the CIMB Group, uh, one of ASEAN's leading banking groups where she is responsible for transforming CIMB into a shaper of sustainable finance and responsible banking practices in Asia. Luan has extensive experience in strategy and transformation, as well as change management. She holds a Bachelor of Arts and a Master's degree in Manufacturing Engineering, as well as a Master of Arts from the University of Cambridge. And the last speaker for today is the esteemed um, architect Von Kot Leong. He is an architect with Architect MAA and a member of the Joint Lembaga Architect Malaysia and Petubohan Architect Malaysia Sustainability Committee that strategize and establish the Green Building Index. He has regularly presented lectures on GBI, passive design strategies, and on the code of practice on energy efficiency and use of renewable energy for non-residential buildings. He is currently the chair of the working group for the MS1525. So Promote is going to give us an overview of how the greening of the national financial system will feed into economic benefits, while Luan will speak specifically on how one large financial services group is stepping up as a responsible lender and allocator of capital. And finally, we will hear from Vaughn about how green buildings with their outsized impacts can lead us into this transition. We look forward to addressing all of your questions. So please send in your questions while our speakers are talking. So if I may now invite Promote 
to give his presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Tatin and BK. Um, I am truly honored to be here, but uh, just spend 30 seconds uh, explaining that I, I'm actually from the dark side of the force. I, I crossed over to the green side of the force somewhere around 2016. And um, I've just been learning a lot of this on the job. So I'm going to give you an overall perspective. Can, can you see the slides? Yes, we can. Okay. I just wanted to be sure before I start. So I'm, I'm sitting at home, uh, looking at the screen, and now I'm imagining maybe 200 people in the crowd. Um, I don't know whether you're smiling. I, I don't know whether you uh, listening or whether you have the video on, but I'm assuming all the best scenarios. So let me put, put it in perspective. Um, I like this chart. Um, is, it came from one of the UN agencies, but it simplifies quite a lot of things. It connects all the key dots that link from savings on uh, the side where you see a lot of people. And uh, these savings are channeled through various intermediaries or influencers, such as credit rating agencies and so on, in the financial economy into the private sector. When it comes to the social investments, the government does this through the tax system and balances out by looking at public goods and services. So if you look at it, the thread that connects all this is responsible finance, or in simple terms, giving money a conscience. And all this links to how important it is for our country or the world in achieving the SDGs or Sustainable Development Goals. Well, as when I look at all this, I still believe that the whole financial economy needs catalysts like regulations and incentives to build momentum. And in many ways, I believe this would pave the way for more green buildings, uh, green or electric cars. And it's quite funny, um, you know, we, the world has been talking about it, regulators and uh, various agencies, uh, NGOs have been talking about it, but it actually took a pandemic and an immediate government action to shift the majorities of companies to work from home mode and possibly 90% uh, reduction in uh, cars on the road. We saw nature bloom and uh, highways that were perpetually jammed with typical, were always jammed, you know, not even... Uh, uh, and what is the solution was uh, we just need to build more roads and highways, but it never cured the problem because there were always more cars to come on board. So the, in summary, uh, all the decisions for every part of the, this food chain, uh, all of us have a part to play uh, and every decision counts to making it green uh, and achieving SDGs and uh, SDG 17 is basically collaborating. So I end on this note and hand the floor back to you, Datin. Thank, thank you so much, Promote. Lovely to hear from you. And that was a very succinct summary indeed, a good overview. Now, could I invite Luanne to share her thoughts with us? Hi, everyone. And uh, thank you for inviting me to come and speak to you um, about what we are doing on uh, sustainability and green finance in particular at CIMB. Uh, just to give you a, a brief overview of what sustainability means at CIMB. And we are, you know, a, a, we, we, are, we strive to be a responsible bank and we, re, we strive to advance our customers as well as society through their lives and, and through uh, and to achieve what they need. Now, how, how do we do that? When, when we look at responsible business, we really look at all aspects of our business and for all stakeholders, not just our shareholders. So it's really, how do we make money? Um, of course, we still need to make money to do good, but how do we make money in a way that is responsible, in a way that does not harm people, in a way that does not harm the environment, but 
also in a way that stimulates more positive things. So this is the overview of how we look at sustainability. Um, this is our roadmap uh, for the for five years. Um, Internally, we look at sustainable action. So our carbon footprint, who we hire, um, we look at our suppliers and whether they're sustainable. The second pillar here is sustainable business. And this is really the core of, of what my function does. I'll talk to that a bit more later. And of course, we've got CSR, which is um, how we use a portion of our profits that is already generated and how we give a portion of that for um, the communities around us. And of course, we've got governance and uh, stakeholder engagement, which we do a lot of. So coming into sustainable finance, you know, what, what does it mean? Um, what does sustainable finance mean in a bank? And we, we, we always look at this in two, kind of from two perspectives. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see is the risk perspective. So um, it's about doing no harm, right? Or doing less harm or as little harm as you can. Um, so, on the left hand side, we look at how our practices impact the environment and the communities around us. And to do that, we look at our customers uh, and what they do. So we have policies and tools in place for our business transactions and uh, specifically our lending to businesses where we do look at the sustainability um, policies as well as track record of our clients. So it's not just um, environmental, but social as well. And we we often have um, action plans agreed with clients that do not meet our requirements in terms of sustainability. So sustainability is two sides. So we need to, in order to be green, you can't just continue doing brown. You have to also reduce the brown. So, so we do both at the same time. Now, of course, on the green side, um, on the right hand side, is how do we create that positive impact? Um, how do we um, you know, drive awareness and education, protection, for example, insurance? How do we enable, how do we facilitate, how do we encourage our clients to be more sustainable in their own right? Because that is our our impact. That is our main impact because we are really um, kind of a financial intermediary. So this is our sustainable finance framework, the positive impact products and services. So we have got 24 subsectors identified where we want to grow and we want to grow aggressively. So and it's it's things around you know education, microfinance, but also uh, specifically on green. There are a lot of things like you know circular economy, green manufacturing, resource efficiency, renewable energy, uh, conservation and restoration. So these are all areas that we're trying to focus on, and um, we are we we are actively hunting for for this kind of business, uh, be it through our um, corporate banking or wholesale banking, commercial banking, or even with individuals. Now, just this is um, a quick view of some of the things that we've done to date. And for those of you who are corporates out there, you would be interested to hear about our sustainability linked loans. Essentially, it's a loan um, that comes with a certain set of sustainability performance targets that we agree upfront with our clients. And if the client meets the, S, the, the, the target on a year on year basis, then we will give a rebate on the interest. Um, so so it's, it's kind of a win win. It, you know, our clients get better and then they get a, a kind of a rebate from us. Um, of course, we, we do our sustainable uh, bonds and sukuks. And also we've got um, renewable energy financing programs for SMEs. And this one is specifically is for small SMEs um, for individuals. So I would highly encourage all of you, if you're buying a car, to go and buy a green car. And if you're doing that, um, you can get a loan from CIMB and we'll give you a, a rebate. Uh, also, it's a reduced interest rate, as well as if you uh, buy a GBI certified house from the developer. Um, we've also got things like an EcoSave uh, savings account where we channel some of the, the deposit to um, or the, the interest to, to uh, green causes. And we've also got things like investment, ESG investment products. So a lot of things, uh, but many more kind of in, in the pipeline. And finally, as I mentioned, you know, we, we do a lot of kind of uh, capability building, um, not just, you know, uh, the main focus is for our customers, 
um, but also just to raise awareness in general so that, you know, this, this um, uh, kind of general uh, landslide, or, or at least hope we hope that this landslide uh, will, will start with more and more people becoming aware of the situation that the planet is in, the climate emergency, etc. So we just need to get many more people on board and um, doing the right thing. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Luan. It's wonderful to hear of a, a financial institution, a large financial like CIMB, stepping up as a responsible corporate citizen and uh, supporting all of these initiatives. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to hear this. And I've got some questions for you, which we will be coming to shortly. Uh, now, if I may pass the floor to architect Vaughan, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, thank you, Datin. How's everybody? And uh, thank you to all of you who chose to spend the afternoon with us during this uh, period of uh, CMCO, wherever you are. Stay safe. Um, I'll be talking a little bit about the green building and the fin financing of green buildings and what we can do in the future. 10 years ago, a group of us, we started the GBI. In fact, we started a conversation. The conversation was about a topic which was on green buildings and the sustainability of the built environment, which covers town planning, you know, uh, um, and all sorts of other things related to building. The group of us consists of uh, volunteers, uh, practicing architects, engineers, quantity surveyors, uh, project managers, and so on. Uh, but in reality, you know, what we touched on was a much, much wider topic. We raised awareness about the environmental sustainability, and we got a whole country talking about it, and we did it using green buildings. Now, in those early days, we faced uh, quite a lot of challenges. We identified a lot of stakeholders. Uh, financial institutions were part of it too. And we also want, want to work out uh, where we are, you know, what's the baseline? Where, where are we individually, you know, as a corporation or as a, a stakeholder, where do we stand? And we noticed one thing, that uh, many people would like to join us on the, on the road to being green, and we are very happy. And I always told the story of the, like a Malaysian highway. We welcome everyone to join the highway. We don't mind whether you're traveling fast or slow. You know, in Malaysian highways, fast cars travel slow lanes, slow cars travel fast lanes. In this case, we really do not mind. So long as everybody travels in the same direction. We also understood the need, the need for a cost to be cost sensitive in terms of uh, for green buildings. And uh, most importantly, we identified how we could tackle them in the early days. But Maybe now 10 years later, before I move on to the financing, let, uh, let, us, uh, let me trumpet a little bit about the success of both GBI and MGBC. MGBC is an NGO, not-for-profit NGO, uh, consists of uh, volunteers. Uh, we, we don't get paid for it. We, only, we, we, we uh, give our time and passion for it, and uh, we, we help the, the, the organization do well. So far, under GBI, the rating scheme that we have uh, created, as of 30th, 30th September, not so long ago, we already have more than 1,000 projects registered to get a GBI certification. And out of which, more than 560 have already been certified of different ratings, silver, gold, uh, certified, or even platinum. And out of those 560 over projects that we have certified, they cover a total of 265 million square feet of gross floor area. Now, I'd like to repeat that, uh, 265 million square feet of gross floor area. How big is your house? You can multiply that and see, and divide it by that and see how many houses are there. More importantly also, because of the way we do our rating, we can also calculate how much carbon dioxide reduction in the emission to the atmosphere that are attributed to these 560 of our projects. In total, we have saved more than 1,300 kilotons of carbon dioxide equivalent every year. That's every year, recurring every year. Now, how many elephants are that? You know, uh, a typical African bull elephant weighs about five tons. So in this case, you could have uh, more than quite a lot of elephants there. You know? So therefore, we have done a lot of this and uh, it is still ongoing. And there are also projects that are coming in and there are also projects that also did not uh, go for green. We know that but because it is all voluntary. So we are happy that, uh, that so many projects, so many people have participated with us and they saw the results there. Now, on the issue of uh, funding and financing, 
initially, we, it was one of the greatest uh, difficulties we faced because almost everybody was talking about costly, how costly it is to go green. Some people were talking about uh, going green might cost another 30, 40% you know, of the total construction cost. Uh, but uh, in Malaysia, we have no data at the time. We could only rely on data overseas. And we knew that the data overseas points to a much better picture. It is not so high. And yet at the same time too, uh, there are a lot of uh, these fear mongers or, or their own particular benefits talked about it. But at the moment, up to now, up to today, we have a lot of data from GPI. And I can confirm to you, and you may have heard it from other speakers on uh, this round of iGEM, that to achieve a GPI certification, to get a, just a basic certified rating, it would only cost you from zero to 2% extra over your construction costs. Okay? To go for silver, the next rating up, it is between one to 3% extra. To go for gold, it is three to 6% extra. And for platinum, it could be five and above. Now, platinum is a personal choice. We do have people who achieve platinum and uh, because they wanted to do something that is uh, out of the extra, which is extraordinary, and they do pay a lot for it. Now, these are not huge costs. They're actually quite small. And we have a lot of projects that we actually recommend them to just go certified. It's good enough. A green building is still a green building. And at the same time, too, we also have uh, the, the help from the governments. Eh? Now, I must say here that uh, successive governments, whether it's Barisan, but, uh, Barisan National, BN, PH, or PN, or whatever else in the future, they have all been very supportive of our efforts to go green. And they have come up with these incentives. 10 years ago, I worked on the incentive, which is called the, the GITA, G-I-T-A, Green Investment Tax Allowance. I worked on the, the writing of the Gazette for that particular one. And in that particular one, it is actually quite good. It rewards the building owners. In other words, uh, if you have a building, you convert that to a green, or it's part of design, you make it a green building when you construct it, and you derive a certain income from that particular building, your income tax can be reduced by having your statutory income, taking, take away the amount you spend on green and therefore reducing your taxable income. So that works very, very well for, for, for many, many people. And to date, it is actually quite interesting that we see that uh, a lot of buildings have already benefited uh, from that. Yeah? And for that to happen, we have so far, so far, GBI has issued uh, green cost certificates to the value of 190 million ringgit, 190 million ringgit. In other words, somewhere out there, there are already building owners who have reduced their income at, at uh, whatever value they have put up, you know, over that period of time, over 10 years. And yet, at the same time too, uh, we also have uh, encouraged them to plow back, in other words, to do more, to, to, to go for the next stage from CBA completion to go for RVA and further improve the building. It's just like when you have a nice car, you can still make it last longer. So that is very important, the 119 million thing. Now, then suddenly the, the, the concept of the issue of uh, green financing as a major stakeholder was a little bit diminished because of this combination of low cost of going green and the available incentives. And yet at the same time too, we keep on encouraging people to, to subscribe to go green. But of course, at the same time, we know that the uh, people, uh, the people come to see us come from different different background, not all are developers. Some are actually building material manufacturers, some are actually doing R&D. And this is, this is what I mean, that we actually have to finance people like that. And because of, because of the widespread, the multiplying effect of a building, let alone being green or not a green, it really doesn't matter. The, 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 the multiplying effect, even despite the fact that the building construction industry in Malaysia, which is a very mature sector of the economy, contributes 15% of our total GDP, it actually touches more than 35% of our total GDP because of other uh, areas that it touches on, like manufacturing, like professional services, and so on and so forth. Which, is, which raises another issue. These are the people who were largely forgotten. You know? We look at the end result, a green building, and therefore we finance or fund the green building, or we allow them to uh, uh, have incentives to encourage the green building. These are the end results. The buildings, the edifices in the, in the, on the skyline you see, these are very visible, which is very important. It is a very important part of it. But yet at the same time, we discovered that behind them, before it could become a green building, there are many processes, much effort, and many projects that need also to be considered for funding. Right? But of course, when it comes to funding, whether it's incentives or, or institutional funding or from banks like Luan said, CI, CIMB, everybody looks at the tangibles, you know, what's the return, what the kind of things. And 
today, I like to encourage people to look at it a little bit aside, you know, put, put the ROI aside and look, look at the effect of a proper, good proper funding, yeah. Now, we, we, we have a duty of care to the environment. This I've said to my members when uh, I was a president 10 years ago on GBC. We, we have a duty of care of the environment and we must see the process go through. And you don't just suddenly see a build, green building. You got to participate in the process. And the moment you participate in it, you find that a lot of people need financial assistance. They need help. Yet at the same time too, we also encourage the rakyat to be more demanding. Now they can ask for more things. You know, hey, look, you know, I, I heard about green, you know, and uh, I have even tested some developers who launched their products. I went to the showroom and asked them what's green. And I was so glad that many of them could answer, could answer me what are the green features of that particular development they're trying to sell. It is wonderful. And I think that awareness is, is growing. And we must continue to, 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 to have that conversation to keep growing, to keep growing and keep growing and so that more and more people will benefit from it. And now with the, with the, the financial institutions coming in, for financial assistance to the others, uh, so-called so far, which have been neglected group. I'm very happy to say that, you know, today's talk would hopefully benefit many people who are out there looking or searching for financial assistance. And you, you would have come to the right place today. I'll end it here and uh, we'll, I'll pass back to Datin. Vaughn, thank you so much. That is really inspiring. It's so heartwarming to hear, or you know, especially from a pioneer on such an important topic. If I may invite the rest of the panelists to come back on again, please. Uh, and then we'll start a few question and answers, uh, you know, just so the audience gets a better feel for um, how you feel about things. So, um, you know, the first question I wanted to ask each of you is, um, especially as the co-organizer for this forum is the Malaysian Green Building Council. So let's head straight in and grapple with the elephant in the room. In an environment of oversupply, with many assets not appearing to be climate resilient or future-proof, with no proper life cycle assessment being conducted, not even an estimate of the carbon footprint, and yet we all recognize and know that buildings have a huge multiplier effect on many lives for many years. So um, if I can ask uh, Promote and then Luan and of course Vaughn to give your views, how do, how do we deal with this? How can we use or how, how do we suggest that finance can energize the pivot from brown to green and reduce the future inventory of stranded assets, which is going to deter investors? What, what, are, what is your view, Promote? Okay. Um... I'm, I'm not, I have a whole bunch of statistics saying that uh, there's oversupply, oversupply, but I think everyone knows it, so I'm not going to touch that. But uh, I, I'm looking at it from a completely different angle now. It's not about uh, whether people go into offices anymore, because there's been a paradigm shift. Uh, and uh, I mean, we're, we're all doing this from home. Uh, and... Uh, so the question is, how do you bring back the work from home mode back to office? Uh, it could be a mix of many ideas. Uh, green buildings can be designed as co-work spaces away from city centers in areas that are close to residential areas with maybe a maximum traveling time of 15 minutes uh, with a reliable green public transport, uh, like green buses and PJ, the electric buses that they have. And Proving that this is a hybrid model that is cost efficient and a better alternative both for the planet for, and both for the recovery of the economy. So it's, it's actually a good time because it, the mindset has already changed. So now if you can tell employers uh, that, uh, hey, um, you have this alternative, to, we're building all these green buildings closer to residential areas, um, and you tell the employees, you don't have to travel all the way to the center of KL and get stuck in a two-hour jam every day. Uh, you, you can travel 15 minutes. Um, you can get back and work at home. Or you, so, um, so the green has to be part of the uh, paradigm shift. Uh, because previously, it's just brown and green. But now, um, the, it's been digitalized out of our offices when we need to. So i just leave with that thought. Absolutely. Thank you. And uh, Luan, earlier you had spoken about fun financing the pivot from brown to green. What are your thoughts? So as, as you know, um, as part of the, 
the conversations that I've had with our, you know, uh, corporate bankers as well as with our clients, you know, what, one of the, the the big barriers that is faced is the separation between the person who bears or company who bears the initial cost of the the green building because there is. The, the cost of construction because you need to um, ensure that your materials are green, your you know your carbon footprint with um, so you can no longer let's say you know export the uh, import the cheapest material from far away. You need to get it locally. So there is th that cost upfront maybe a little bit more. But the question is whether um, the builder can get the long term benefit. See, there is long term benefit, but that is reaped by the person who operates it later on. So the question is whether the person who then buys it, so let's say, you know, um, I buy a greenhouse, whether I then want uh, or am willing to put in that little bit extra to get that, uh, that, that green building. And I guess it's also just, you know, the, the, the whole conversation between do I want to fork it up now and then hope that the savings come in because I I'm also not sure yeah I'm just just talking from that from the end buyer perspective so that that separation I think is is one of the, the the key concerns and especially you know in an environment of oversupply it is just even harder yeah of course I fully agree with you uh, Vaughn do you have any ideas how are okay. we gonna... yeah thank you thank you Datin yeah um, okay overhanging oversupply is not uh, a modern problem right? uh, over last maybe since the last 50 years ago there already has been that um, the reasons for oversupply is not whether because the building is green or not green um, bank negara malaysia has identified about five reasons why uh, overhang occurred huh? and uh, even though they're talking about affordable buildings huh? affordable homes the reasons are much the same um, first is that uh, a lot of development in malaysia are done by private developers and uh, they Let's say grandfather left me a piece of land, so this time I do something and hopefully generate some income to sustain my next generation and so on and so forth. Everybody does it individually. Uh, there's very little cohesive, co cohesive master plan. There are master plans, some good ones I've come across, which is wonderful, but not enough uh, to, to prevent uh, overhang from happening. And uh, building homes in Malaysia is a supply side economics. You know? In the past, you build, somebody will buy. You know, it's always been the case. Even now, it's the same thing. But then again, these days, buyers are more, more smarter uh, more, and they have better information. And uh, with the, the, so much information at our fingertips on the phones, you know, we can actually uh, compare a lot of things. So that supply side now has to take care of uh, many things. But of course, the basic thing is always about location, location, location. So if you have built a building in a uh, not, not so ideal location, you tend to suffer, whether it's the times are good or bad, you know? And a lot of people also, a lot of developers also never do enough market research. You know, I'm an architect, many of my clients, we encourage them to do market research. And yes, they do the market research. And they find out that, okay, for this particular location, what are the unit types are, are best? And what are the, the, the sizes? What are the facilities that people there are looking for? So these are the things that have to be addressed. A lot of those uh, overhang products are just supply side problems, you know? and the, 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 another reason is that the high cost of land, land has gone up significantly, but it was not, it is not matched by our Malaysian wages growth. Our wage growth has been stagnant for some time. Even Bank Negara admits that. Right? Uh, we haven't been growing for since uh, 2008 or something like that. I, I'm quite surprised. In fact, uh, I shouldn't be surprised. My salary hasn't gone up that much in those days, in those times in any way. <laughs> but um, as I said, another thing is that uh, uh, people are becoming more uh, conversant and more knowledgeable about buildings. And the options that they have, the buyers have. Uh, in Malaysia, the building typologies are huge. You know, I like in Singapore, Hong Kong, everything is high rise. In Malaysia, we have low rise, we have uh, uh, terrace houses, we have uh, walk-up flats. We have so many things. We have a uh, high-end condo, we have uh, service apartments, Soho, Sovo, whatever. So, you know, there's so many types you can pick and choose. And there's another part of it that uh, uh, people are looking out for is the rental market, you know? Now, a lot of people in, um, in, the, in, in this country, prefer to live in your own home, you don't want to rent, which is wonderful, which is nice. But there is this huge group of people who need to rent. And therefore, if we have a good uh, uh, relationship, uh, a good, which is a good trust relationship between landlord and uh, 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 people who rent, and this relationship is 
supported by a good legal framework that protects both sides, then I think very few, I, I think a lot of uh, these this units, overhang units will be easily taken up. You know? So therefore, I think um, uh, the, 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 the issue here is about sustainable design and the sustainability is actually in the, early on in the master planning. What do you do? How do you stretch out this development? Is it going to be a seven-year plan or is it going to be a 15-year plan? How do you see the population movement and so on and so forth? A lot of these things happen up front, not later on. No point come crying and say, I couldn't sell, you know, and, and blame almost everybody and blame the banks for not lending. And in fact, the banks were the, 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 the poor victims of this kind of argument, you know. I, I know some bankers who, who, who explain to me what happened. And it, it, is, it is not fair. But anyway, this is happening. This is happening. So how to pivot from brown to green, uh, your, your question, uh, um, what I believe is that since there's so much overhang out there, uh, whether it is commercial building or residential building, let's tackle existing buildings, shall we? Existing buildings is, is a huge stock, you know, huge, uh, uh, a, lot of, a lot of gross spot areas of uh, existing buildings uh, already in the market. Some of it unused. You can see shop houses, most of them are empty. And uh, therefore, it is, it is this huge market, huge uh, property that we need to tackle. What do I mean by tackling existing buildings? Now, I, I want to give you the idea of 80-20. Uh, now, I know that a lot of people talk about 80-20, they can't say, yes, this is also 80-20, but not exactly the same. What it says is that in a developing country, in 20 years' time, 80% of the buildings 20 years' time are already built today. For example, in the year, if, if, you, you, can, you, if you can do time traveling, uh, today, this year is 2020. If you travel to 2040, you realize that when you, when you land in 2040, 80% of the buildings that you see in 2040 have already or are already being constructed in today, 2020. So if you don't do anything with it, we're going to miss the boat of greening them, of repurposing them, like Promot said, huh? You're changing users of buildings and kind of things. Re repurposing buildings. Shopping centers could be colleges. Colleges could be shopping centers, or oh, whichever way, the kind of thing. Huh? Uh, um, hotels can be, become service apartments, and so on and so forth. There are huge market there. But one of the greatest stumping, stumping blocks is, again, financing. Now, a lot of these people come to see us and say, okay, look, I want to convert my, uh, this building. I haven't bought yet. I'm thinking of buying this existing hotel. Times are bad. The, the, the hotel owner has, uh, a hotel uh, operator has left, left the building back to the hotel, building hotel owner, the building owner, and the building owner doesn't know what to do. So we started a few things. And of course, once, once a, a building needs to be refurbished and the kind of things, you need something, you need some financing, you know. And we want them to be bold. We want them to be brave to make a decision. Yes, this is my property. I want to convert this from A to B, from a hotel to service apartments. You know, let's do it. But they still need to do, look, look for financing. This is one of the areas we talk about. Yeah. Um, I think uh, that, that is uh, your, your question. That it, yeah. So I think uh, I'll pass back to you first. Yeah. Thank can, you. Can, can I add, add on to that a bit? Please yeah. come on. Um, I think the 80-20 or the 20-80 uh, time travel thing uh, is a wake-up call uh, because, and I'm, I'm going to sound like but if we don't have regulation in place that says that every building has to be green, then um, uh, of course the banks won't have a choice. They will have to lend, uh, if they want to have property sector exposure, it will only be green buildings. And uh, market dynamics will change, pricing will change, because uh, Malaysia has decided that it's going to be only green buildings, just like I think France has decided that at a certain point, uh, there will only be electric cars or something like that. So that policy change is very important. I, I go back to one point, if we don't do it now, then we'll be stuck with brown, it's, it's not something that you can just uh, paint the building green and call it green. I, I wish it was so simple. I totally agree, Pramod. I, I think um, one of the things we, we, we have to remember is that uh, going green is still a very much a voluntary process in this country and in most countries. There's only one country in the world where going green is compulsory, and that is Singapore. Uh, there are mixed results there. Uh, I won't go into that, but uh, that will take another hour. But at the same time, too, going green is quite interesting. In some countries, they encourage in a different way. In Malaysia, we, we also, our government, like I mentioned, also encourage in a, in a, in a way that suits us. Um, we, you see, the, the industry has a, is a very mature sector of the economy. We already have enough legislations and regulations to control it. Um, what we wanted to do was to bring forward a new idea called green building without um, upsetting the existing leg legislations. 
because otherwise it will take a long, long time for it to happen. And yeah. we want it to be voluntary first. I, I've been telling people a long time ago, don't make this too compulsory, GBI. Don't make it compulsory, make it voluntary. After some time, I say, I don't know when. It could be, you know, maybe another five years, 10 years or 20 years, I really don't know. When the take up, the understanding of, of the people, you know, has uh, reached a certain level of awareness that they accept this and that they say, this is the way I want. It is a push and pull, you know. The top part can be doing something, the bottom part, the people they say, I want it, I demand it, you know, the kind of things. And you go to buy your, your aircon, you want, you say, I want a five star uh, inverter system aircon, kind of, you know, th those are things that people are raising awareness. So it will come a time, it will come a time. But Luen, at the moment, Luen, we still got to keep encouraging. Luen, it sounds as though there's a lot of demand for financing this transition. Yes and no, because, um, you know, people, and, and I'm talking about both businesses as well as individuals and even governments, right? When you say green, oh, of course, everybody wants green. You say you want brown, you want green, of course, you want green. But only if it comes at no cost and at no cost to my convenience as a person, right? So everyone has this choice, right? Apart from unless, let's say, you, you are really, really poor and you really cannot afford it. But everybody has this choice, right? So it's, it's, it's a, you know, very often it's a, a trade-off between, okay, you know, am I going to buy one more, I don't know, handbag or extra car or, or you know, or do I want to maybe put that money into a rainwater harvesting system. It's just a choice. So when, when people say, you know, oh, but it's so expensive, it, there, it's not costless, but it's a question of what your priorities are, right? So, so the question then is when and how much would it take for people to actually realize that, hey, actually, yeah, this is my future I'm talking about. You know, this is actually... If everybody, you know, buys that extra hamburger with beef and, and, you know, this is actually going to make it really bad for my kids and my kids' kids. So let's just, let's just take it back to the very simple uh, baseline, right? It's all down to personal choices and personal awareness. And, and if, if people just don't recognize or don't want to recognize it, especially because nobody else is, you know, oh, you got these crazy tree huggers, you know. As long as that doesn't change, um, then, then there will never be sufficient demand for green buildings. And then the developers are not going to, you know, build green buildings because people are not asking for them, not willing to pay. So, so it's a vicious cycle. So as one said, you know, it, it, everything depends on everything. So I guess that's where you need regulation to come in to because you can't expect every single human being to change their, their mind um, in time to save us from global disaster. So that's where the, the government needs to come in. Yeah, thank you. You know, it reminds me when I co-founded Climate Governance Malaysia last year, I was on a learning curve as well. I guess we all are, except for maybe Vaughn, who's like such a veteran of this. No, I'm and, also learning, yeah. <laughs> and uh, one of the things that's really struck home, especially this year, is the increased sense of urgency. I think a few years back, everyone thought, oh, it's, you know, we're going to lose the polar bears, the coral reefs are going to be dying. But now there's a very, very clear sense that it's here and now we need to act now. We are the last generation that can do anything about this. And there's this sense of urgency or else the world is going to be changed irrevocably forever. And that responsibility is ours. Mm. And so I wanted to ask you as a panel another question because uh, not all of us have the same levels of social awareness. And uh, what is the ethos that we should be aiming for? Is it the role of government to incentivize the transition? After all, there are already many avenues of green financing which actually don't reach the right audience at the right time. Or does all of society and all of business need to step up more? Um, and what is the role of green building certifications? Can it be a tool to increase awareness in this space? Vaughn seems to have been doing this for years. Is it time to mandate this now? Could I circle back to promote again to get your views? Okay. Um, it, it's quite interesting now that uh, if you look at the power of money, uh, if I take the PRI statistics of assets under management, 
In 2006, it was 6.5 trillion. And today, it is 103 trillion. So there's a lot of money. Uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, principles of responsible banks, uh, 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 institutions like CIMB. Uh, but my point is, the money is moving there. Uh, MNCs will only want to be in green buildings, some of them. Uh, the, um, and they are pushed by their shareholders, uh, they are pushed by their stakeholders. But if you look at uh, funding, uh, 14, uh, there are 14 green bonds that have come out in Malaysia, and uh, two of them are green buildings. Uh, one was for KLI2, one was uh, for uh, the PNB uh, Wawasan 118. And in ASEAN, 36% of the green bonds are for green buildings. Globally, it's only 18. So ASEAN is actually doing quite well. And um, so it's, it's a mix of uh, educating the money, uh, educating the, uh, uh, the average person on the street, uh, because we were all taught in school not to litter and throw. So it's the same concept, is the idea stays with you. Um, why, why, are, you know, why are actually businesses going against what we are taught in school? You know, you don't dirty uh, the surroundings. You don't, you go to the dustbin and throw it away. So it's, 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 it's very simple. Uh, it needs to be in the whole ecosystem. All of us have a part to play. The money is already moving there. Um, and but it, it would help if there is actually government legislation to push it through because I don't think we can wait any longer. Okay, understood. Luan, is it a choice? Should, are we waiting for government or does all of society need to step up? You know, um, when we talk about carbon footprint and, and measurement and things like that, you know, and you mentioned there's an acceleration um, this year and maybe a few years, to, uh, last one or two years, towards um, more carbon consciousness, etc. But did you know that every, you know, molecule of carbon dioxide that's generated today will still be here in 300 years to 1,000 years? So we are, human race, uh, we're really cutting it to the last minute, you know. So it's like, a, it's like an, almost like an experiment, yeah, to see, ooh, how far can we push because I want to make, I want to make my, I want to keep making my money. Remember, how far can we push? How long can we wait until we have to change? And you know, when we talk about climate risk, we talk about both physical risk, which is you know uh, your your rising sea levels, extreme weather events, water stress, but also transition risk. And you will see that you know when governments change their policies, so like China recently. Um, uh, you know, announced net zero target by 2060, South Korea by 2050, declared a climate emergency. Overnight, you will see policies changing. Overnight, you will see banks and investors saying, okay, I'm not going to do this sector anymore. So, so, and look, we can see this coming, right? Paris is, you know, Paris Climate Accord targets 2030 goals. This is coming already. So if you're a business and you're sitting out there and saying, oh, let's wait and see, wait for government to, to change the thing, their, their, their regula regulations, when government changes their regulations, it's going to be fast. Imagine, you know, so, so uh, uh, Zainu Ujang already has mentioned that, you know, the government is looking at a carbon tax. You know that this is coming, right? So shouldn't you be preparing now? Shouldn't you be moderate modeling the impact on Europe, you know? So please do do prepare, you know, and this is for yourself. Yeah. You're not doing it because, oh, I'm so generous, I'm so big hearted, or whatever. This is for yourself. So don't wait for the government. And because we are so close to the edge, and I really don't want to gamble, you know, seven, eight billion lives on on how to see how how long we can wait. And you're waiting for a grey rhino to hit you, huh? It's no longer a black swan. So does this make sense to say that, okay, oh, I, uh, I don't want to do this because the government hasn't told me or I, uh, I'm not getting an incentive for this. Do you need an incentive to save your own life, to save your kids' lives? Uh, it, it just doesn't make sense to me. So 
So everybody needs to move. Very like everybody. Yeah, I fully agree with you. Yeah, uh, Vaughn, what would what would you like? Is it government's responsibility or is it all of society that needs to step up? Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> I refer back to your early part of the question that we talked about the ethos. Huh? I think I can only, only recommend two words. Think sustainability. Yeah. Just like in the past, you got a think safety campaign. You know, it's called think sustainability. Now, all of us in here in this chat group or in uh, listening to us, we are, we are all converted to the idea of uh, sustainability anymore. Already, uh, we, we don't need to push it any harder to convince each other. But at the same time, too, I like to uh, like to preach uh, to those who are not yet converted. Uh, it's actually very simple. It's about human beings. We, like Luan said, we are at the age like Promot also said the same. We want to make sure that people will be able to think about think sustainability automatically. It comes straight away. No need to take a book out of the shelf and start reading. It is it's ingrained in our the way we think. It is about sustainability thinking. Now. Um, whether that can be legislated, I don't think so. But there are other things, there are other ways you can encourage that thinking to happen. You know, like, uh, for example, the, uh, you can have other forms of uh, uh, like carbon footprint ratings, uh, carbon footprint targets, and so on and so forth, like China. Now, talk about China. Just allow me one minute to talk about that, uh, a situation I had in China, uh, I experienced in China, which is quite amazing. That was like uh, eight years ago. I was representing MGBC uh, to, to a conference in China. Uh, they rolled out this old man, this uh, septuagenarian, 70s. Yeah? Uh, he came out, he, he, he's, he was sent from Beijing. Yeah? The, the conference was in Shenzhen. And he, in his, open, in his uh, keynote address, he was saying that uh, the, 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 the People's, Republic, People's Republic government of China will adopt sustainability as a basis for all policies. That includes education, agriculture, transport, finance, uh, uh, military, anything, you name it, you know. That was in 2012, you know. I, then I, I spoke to the guy next to me, who is from uh, one of the government ministries in, from Malaysia. I said, look, this old man can think this way. Why is it that we cannot do the same in our country, you know? And yet we say that uh, these are the communist people, they are backward, they can't think, you know, there are all sorts of things. But they, here you are, classic example, this guy, late 70s, you know, can, can, do, the, can do it, you know. These, these are the things we want them to do and we want the government to see and transform, you know. And yet at the same time too, we have to move together, not just the government, but the people. No point having a law where you have a lot of uh, stake and, uh, and uh, the people suffers because of the lack of understanding. Yeah. Uh, uh, choices have to be made, have to be there for, for people to make, but we have to reduce the, those green choices and introduce more green choices for them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Vaughn. Um, we need, we're now making the journey of a multi-decade transition that's deeply complicated. As I said in my speech yesterday, this is a decisive decade of humanity. And it's not just about decarbonizing, it's maintaining our biodiversity, it's transforming the world's food system, it's maintaining our carbon sinks, protecting our forests and jungles. And one thing is for sure, we all live off the environment and we're not going to be able to have a successful business on a dead planet. So we know that environmental sustainability and commercial sustainability are one and the same thing. So uh, just to wrap up with this wonderful panel, it's been such a pleasure spending this afternoon with the three of you. Um, what are the few words that you want to leave with our audience today? What is the takeaway that you want to leave with them? Can we start with Promote? Okay. Um, uh, I used to watch a lot of wildlife shows and uh, there's a common theme uh, with fur trade and all that. So when the buying stops, the killing stops. But when money gets a conscience, SDGs become a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Pramod. Lu Luan. I would like to say that, you know, there are a million reasons why you cannot do sustainability, why you cannot do this, cannot do that. Uh, but you only need one reason to start. So just start somewhere, whatever it is, just start. Baby steps, absolutely, absolutely. And Vaughn, what are your final thoughts for our audience? Okay, I echo what I just said just now, which is also part of uh, MGBC's thinking. Think sustainability, be bold, be bold in, uh, in doing what you want to do, be passionate. And uh, I, I, I can assure you, all the MGBC uh, council members are extremely passionate people. And be inclusive, 
because you never know. If you try to be exclusive and say, okay, look, I only admit a certain group of people, you will miss out a lot of ideas. I have come across meeting so many stakeholders, wonderful, wonderful ideas. Uh, uh, even uh, anywhere, I mean, uh, let's not put who they are, but people have wonderful, wonderful ways of seeing different things. You open your minds. So be bold, be passionate, and be inclusive. Think sustainability. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> to all members of our audience, thank you so much for spending this afternoon with us. Please follow all of our panelists. The great work that Vaughn, Luan and Promot are doing, they are a source of rich and deep content. Follow them when they're having their conferences and listen to what they're saying. Do a little bit every day to make a difference. Uh, Climate Governance Malaysia as well is running regular webinars all the time, at least one or two a month, and they're all free. Our next one is on the 11th of November on renewable energy. Um, so everyone has a role to play. This is a all of society problem and approach is needed. Thank you so much. And I will now hand this back to BK. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for such a great session. Um, please head up to www.mgbc.org.my and sign up as a member to support us in our efforts. Um, we hope to see you there and we hope you've benefited from this lecture series, uh, from this session. Uh, we have many more in much more different um, diversified uh, subjects and topics and at different depths. With that, I'd like to leave you with uh, something we, I made up on my own with some help from my Vice President, Serena Hijas. And it's an analogy. And if you could just think about this while we close this session. Climate change is the pandemic. Any construction related business is the patient. We, the professionals in the business are the frontliners and the researchers to come up with the vaccine. Yet, after so many years of our efforts, are we close to a near not? If everyone can progress and respond, especially governments, at the similar speed they did as they responded to the COVID-19 pandemic, what would the situation be? Mm. Would we then be able to flatten the climate pandemic curve? Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.